Hello, welcome everyone to our session, Get Low Latency, which is about American Express's journey to create a highly performant, low latent payment network for processing our credit card transactions. I'm Tyler Wadeen and my co-presenter with me is Ben Kane. And I lead the core platforms SRE function at American Express which is responsible for ensuring high availability across many of our critical customer journeys, including credit card transaction processing that runs on the payment network that we're gonna talk about today. In my previous roles, I was in several roles around infrastructure engineering and infrastructure architecture, uh, where we built uh, software-defined hybrid cloud infrastructure stacks. And for those of you TCPIP enthusiasts, a little corny joke. My favorite greeting is a three-way handshake. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben, and I'm a distinguished engineer at American Express. I work on our core payments platforms, the, the things that Tyler helps us keep the lights on. And uh, throughout my career, uh, I've held both infrastructure and software engineering roles. And a lot of those roles have kind of led me towards working on things like our payment network, where it's highly distributed systems that have to be up all the time, and they need to be scalable and low latency. And that, that is really where I've kind of found my niche. And today, what we're going to talk about is one of the things that Tyler and I worked on, which is really how we modernized our payment network. So. In 2018, we started an initiative to modernize our payment network and build it from the ground up. And we wanted to future-proof this platform as much as we could. And we wanted it to be very flexible for any changes in the payment space because we see there is change coming in the payment space and we need to be kind of ready in order to pivot to that change. We need to be able to build our system and design our system that allows us to be ready for those changes. But we also need this thing to be fast and all of these things. Um, so what we chose was a microservices based architecture. We chose kind of a modern API based interactions for internal communications, which was a bit of a big change for something like a payment network. And we chose to run our applications within containers running on Kubernetes. Now, if you're familiar with payment networks, then you'll know that scale, resiliency, and low latency are all core characteristics. But when we kind of look at the previous side where we wanted to be future-proof and able to adapt our architecture to any changes in the industry and choosing something like microservices, well, microservices are great for scale, but they're not well known for low latency. They're not necessarily well known for resiliency. In some ways, yes, some ways, no. Uh, and using APIs versus low level TCP connections, like these are different choices that you would not typically make for a payment network, but we did. And we've had some success with this. And really that is what today's talk is about, is the, what we've done, how we approached building a low latency microservices based platform. And Tyler is gonna walk us through kind of our initial approaches on that. Yeah, so you know, all good things have downsides, including microservices. And so we're gonna talk through the problem statement that we encountered with microservices and what probably many of you have encountered when you take a monolithic or mainframe based application and you decide to cut it into a bunch of different pieces, deploy it as microservices, and you end up something with something similar to what you see on the right side of the screen there, which is something you didn't really need to worry about when everything was very tightly coupled. And now it's heavily distributed. And now you have a significant dependency on the network. 
And that network overhead comes in many different variations. The first is the obvious, right? The amount of processing and time it takes because you have all these additional calls that are going across all of these additional hops. And with all of that, there is a time penalty associated. And then you need to account for the fact that how fast are all those calls going to be? Are they going to be multi-threaded? Are they going to connect through physical stateful, de stateful devices or service mesh? Uh, and then are, how are you going to tune all of those things? Because when you have this many connections going across this much infrastructure, you're bound to have things that restart, that fail, that the links go down. And if you want to have high availability, you need to be able to adapt and absorb those thousands of paper cuts, the little nicks and cuts that come with a heavily distributed system. And if you look at, you know, the types of penalties that you could see, especially if you're not controlling your routing between region, and if you think, well, I have multiple regions, so I'm more redundant. But if you're not controlling the flow of that, you can easily see, you know, 60 milliseconds additional round trip between the East Coast and West Coast or a couple hundred milliseconds when you're looking cross continent. And all of that adds up to a significant amount of latency that you have to then solve for. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see that we solve for this in several different ways. And three of those at the top are what we're gonna focus on for the most part today, which is local affinity and cross-region routing. You know, How do you control the topology to make it as efficient as possible? HTTP2 based protocols for service to service calls, right? What type of multi-threading, how quick can you establish those connections between services? Data locality, how are you caching data to ensure that you can do the most efficient processing of that transaction with local data? Asynchronous logging, which is, you know, how do you get the most amount of data and insights and observability out of those services with metrics with the least amount of overhead and penalty on the system? Local disks for databases versus software-defined storage. You know, the database already has multiple copies of the data. So do you really need multiple copies deployed on top of software defined infrastructure that also creates multiple copies of that data? Because there's a penalty associated with that. And then where it made sense choosing programming languages that helped us have high performance for our most critical services. And we selected Go as our programming language for some of those critical services in our payment network. So we had a lot of different design principles that we use to solve for the problems that we've outlined. And the first is the cell-based approach. And the idea is that each cell is completely independent and autonomous. And that is from the ground up. That's the observability stack, that's vault, that's secrets, that's um, even you know load balancing, firewalling, service mesh, all of that is completely independent and self-contained. And even the data, right? We don't want to then they have to make an external call to some centralized database somewhere. We wanted to preload, pre-cache, and have databases that were all completely independent between cells. And we do all of that because obviously we're looking for the most efficient flow possible. And we also, you know, not just having the most efficient flow process possible once you get to the cell, but how do we put the clients to the closest cell so that even the latency that they experience between themselves and getting to the cell as, is as little as possible. And then we really want to control the flows, right? We do not want things, you know, crisscrossing across cells without in us being intentional about that. So if there's an issue within each of those cells, you know, they all have redundancy inside the cell, but we don't need a crazy amount because at any point, we just remove a cell from rotation because we have many cells available to process the traffic. So if we want to do a maintenance because there's patching or changes going on, we can easily reroute with that cell router. And if there's any failure below in the different services, we'll automatically reroute. But in business as usual processing, everything stays self-contained within the cell. And so how do we do that? How do we ensure local affinity? So we did that in a variety of different ways. But one of the biggest is each cell had its own Kubernetes cluster. And we focused on all service to service calls and all pod to pod calls going directly to each other. And so if you look at the difference between the left side and the right side, the left side is very dependent upon 
going to physical or virtual stateful devices, whether that's load balancers or firewalls. And now you're traversing up and down multiple hops in order to achieve getting that you know service to connect to another service. Whereas in pod to pod, we're greatly reducing the number of dependencies. And the number of dependencies matters because each one of those stateful hops, of course, adds a penalty of latency. And also you could have policy pushes, you could have maintenance events, all of those things can further disrupt your communication and your traffic. So instead, we leverage native technologies for those types of things, whether it's MTLS, whether it's service mesh, which Ben will talk about here shortly, in order to reduce the amount of dependencies we had on these central funnel points and enable everything to be pod to pod as efficient as possible. Over to Ben. So as Tyler said, we like to process each transaction within the cell it lands in and never leave that cell, at least as much as possible. And, or if we do leave that cell, be very intentional about leaving that cell. So the approach that we took is we have to have data in those cells. And a lot of our use cases around data kind of fit, didn't fit one pattern. And what we ended up doing is actually following three patterns for caching and data locality. The first pattern is a preloaded read through cache where data that is fairly static or doesn't change very often, uh, we could, as soon as it changes, distribute that data out to all of the different cells and get that data to where it needs to be before a transaction actually requires it. This is our preferred method, of course, wherever possible. But some data is actually based on transactions themselves. Sometimes we need to get data from the transaction to other cells for subsequent transactions. And when we have those situations, what we've done is we actually use message-based replication where we replicate the event to each cell. And within each cell, we take the data that we need from that event and store it locally. So every cell eventually will get every transaction's data that we, when we need to do this uh, and have that available. But this is eventual consistency, which works for many cases. And we try to use this as like our second uh, preferred approach whenever possible. But there are times where we need strong consistency. And where we need strong consistency, which is usually something that's based on a previous transaction, we actually route transactions using our cell router to the site that the last transaction was made. So we have this concept of transaction affinity as well, where we can't distribute that data uh, efficiently in a quick enough time, we route the transaction to where the data is instead. And we follow these three patterns and we're very specific about which we use and for different use cases. And we use all three essentially within our platform. Now, data is important, but as Tyler mentioned, those pod to pod communications are just as important. And one of the biggest optimizations that we made with our platform was actually moving from HTTP one to HTTP two based uh, protocols. And the reason why we see a huge performance increase with HTTP one to HTTP two is really core to the design of HTTP two. With HTTP one, it's a synchronous based protocol. So the client makes a request to the server, that server has to respond to the client before the, the client can send a second request. So one request goes to the server, you have to get a response, then you can send the second one. With HTTP2, the requests, this is actually asynchronous, and requests can be sent across a single connection multiple times. So you can send request number one, request number two, request number three, and then the server can respond to those requests out of order or as it as it responds. And you're not waiting for the previous request to finish for the next request to be sent by the client. And this kind of multiplexing of connections really allows a huge kind of throughput increase from our pod to pod communication. Now, the challenge with this was this brings some complexity. As Tyler mentioned, we brought in a service mesh 
into our platform. And the reason we brought in a service mesh is because when we moved to HTTP2, what we found was the native load balancing within Kubernetes, Kube Proxy, uh, is a layer four connection-based load balancer. And when we had that single connection passing multiple transactions, what ended up happening was one pod or maybe a series of pods was getting all of, all of the traffic because our traffic was not evenly distributed. So essentially we were just hammering a single pod with all of our transactions, which wasn't efficient. So what we ended up doing was bringing in Envoy to, which is a layer seven load balancer to evenly distribute our requests. And those requests get distributed across all the pods. Our pods are able to respond to them faster. They're not getting overloaded. So HTTP2 was great from a performance perspective, but it added a level of complexity that we had to decide, was this worth the trade-off? And for us, it was worth the trade-off, but it may not be worth the trade-off for everybody. So what we believe in summary is in order to get low, you have to focus on locality, taking the most direct path. In order to get low, you have to limit your dependencies, lower your dependencies. You need to push data to your cells or your nodes or whatever you call them ahead of time to where the data is there when the transaction needs it. To get low, you have to use asynchronous communications instead of synchronous communications. If I had this all over it, to do again, I would have invested heavier into gRPC. We used it in some key places, but not everywhere. And if I were to do it today, I would use it everywhere. In order to get low, this is the most important piece. You have to make latency and resiliency first class features of your platform. This is what we did when we started this. We made sure that we had defined SLAs we made sure that we had targets that were lower than those SLAs. And we made this a first class feature of our platform. If our latency wasn't where it needed to be, we stopped the development train and we fixed it until it was. And these are the lessons that we learned through that process. And we hope that they help you, but they may not be applicable to every use case. So do take these with a grain of salt. And that is our talk. Thank you for joining us for this. Uh, my name is Ben Kane, again, Distinguished Engineer at American Express. Feel free to follow me on LinkedIn or my blog, uh, which are here on the slide. Well, I'm Tyler Wadeen. I do appreciate you guys joining and listening into our session. I do not have a blog, but I do have a LinkedIn and I uh, appreciate you guys joining.